Well, good morning and welcome to Berlin Buzzwords. I'm really pleased to be invited here today. Um, I'm going to try and talk a little bit about what we're doing um, to inspire the next generation of folks to come in and join this wonderful circus of software and hardware development that um, we're working on. Um, I work on Red Hat, for Red Hat, it's my day job. I work on OpenShift and OpenStack and Kubernetes and Docker and all that good stuff, but I'm not going to talk about any of that this morning. Um, I'm coming off a weekend of maker fairs. We just hosted our second annual Maker Fair. This is a kind of a cloudy map, um, but this is Van just north of Vancouver in British Columbia, Canada, which I flew in from yesterday, so it's about 12.30 a.m. my time, so I'm standing up, which is a good thing. Uh, this was our second Maker Fair that we did on the coast. Um, I'm about a 45-minute boat ride up on the mainland in, um, from Vancouver, B.C., if you know the west coast of Canada. And where I live is about five communities, which make up about 30,000 people. Um, that's adults, kids, and everything. And we had over 1,000 of them show up for a one-day maker fair. And so what we've been do what's been happening, and if, if any, of, any of you live in the cities, you realize that um, it's very expensive to live in the cities, and a lot of people are migrating up to the coast, and so we're getting a lot of tech folks. And so the Sunshine Coast is actually the fastest-growing maker community in all of Canada right now. So, and this is the crew that I work with on... Um, it's called, we are called the Coast Makers, and we're the ones that put it on. There's a whole bunch more, but this was the only ones I could get to come around and for the picture that we were posing that day. And we're called the Coast Makers, and we do all of this stuff. Um, but I started a, uh, a project in collaboration with all the Coast Makers called Get Makered Labs. And what I do in my day job is I'm a technology evangelist and a community manager, or otherwise known as a cat herder. I try and get folks to work on my open source projects. And so I'm taking some of those skills and using that to teach um, teachers and teach students how to teach tech in the school systems. Um, and what we've been doing is creating uh, mobile maker spaces. And those mobile maker spaces are using a, some new concepts called connected learning, which comes out of Stanford University. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that today and how we're using these things to try and get to the next level and the next generation of people who will be doing the jobs that you're doing. So your replacements is what I'm trying to inspire. Um, so first, a bit of history, because... Um, I'm always shocked at how long I've managed to stay in this business. And about a year ago, I was in the Computer History Museum down in um, Silicon Valley. And if you ever get a chance, please go. It's wonderful. The sad thing is, I'm in the History Museum. <laughs> so when I started my career back in the early 80s, uh, my first job out of the university was working for Nike. Um, I love to call them the sneaker people. They like to be called the athletic footwear people. And um, I did all of the CAD CAM and CNC machining work to do the soles of sneakers. So sneaker bottoms, these things. And it was really fun. Used all the math skills that I, and splines and curves and all that kind of fun stuff. And the machine that I sat on um, and the, the, the big huge tube and the CNC machines cost over a million dollars just for my one place that I was sitting at with the software, the training, all the connectivity. And all of that has now been commoditized. So this is, this is actually one of the molds that I worked on. It's really and truly in the History Museum. Um, but someday, I'd like to retire. Um, and, you know, I, I do all this community development stuff because basically what I'm looking for is I'm looking for my replacement. Um, so when I was at university back in 1982, 83, um, I was one of three women in a computer science class uh, group for that going through as freshmen. And um, I'd like to see many more of us going through computer science. This is my daughter. I have two, two girls. They're now 15 and 20. One's in university and the other one's two years into high school. And what I started noticing was um, in the school system where they were going, they were getting very bored in the IT classes or with co computer class. And when I asked, and actually one of them, this one, Haley, was um, kind of getting a bad grade. 
And so I work in tech, and my wife, she's also a web designer. So, heck, what's going on here? These kids should be, like, acing this class. And when I went in to talk to the teachers um, about my problem child, um, what it was is they were teaching the kids how to do PowerPoint. They weren't doing anything interesting. And it wasn't the teacher's fault. It was really, and it wasn't the kid's fault. It was just the training and the background that the teachers were getting and the time that they were getting to do this was, um, was not sufficient. So what we did instead of, you know, giving heck to the teachers, we decided that we would do something about that. Because it wasn't just the, the teachers in the elementary schools and the high schools, but also um, if you're in North America, there are currently declining enrollments in education around engineering, computer science, not just for women, but for everybody. Um, kids are not choosing to go into computer science anymore, and, or into engineering, or into that. So it's, um, there's a, a sort of a problem that's at the center of all of this that we've really got to get to. How do we get kids inspired to work on the things that are going to make our lives better as we get older and bring in the new innovation. So we're trying to figure out this problem. And then there was another problem between um, like web designers, like my wife and other people, um, do the really cool stuff, write mobile apps, do use, write all the services that run on top of things, the really beautiful UI and fun stuff, versus the people who are building infrastructure. And so we really wanted to get kids to understand the underpinnings of the things that they were working on. Um, and to get to people to think like that, to think not just on the surface level, not just to use their iPhones or their iPads or their Xboxes, things. Think about how things work inside. So um, I work for Red Hat, so I have to throw a Linux picture in here. So Linux, um, it's not so much fun to work on if you're a Linux kernel person. And the Linux kernel community's idea of recruiting people is giving them um, popcorn. And it didn't work. You know, that's not going to get a kid to start working on the Linux kernel. So we had to do something more. So we came up with this idea. It wasn't just mine. Um, kids really like circuses, right? So what we thought we would do is bring the circus to them. Um, but still, when you have a circus, somebody has to build the tent. Somebody has to put the tent up. Someone has to provide the services that are going to be used underneath those tents. So starting to teach all of the concepts that take it to the next level. Because if we don't start teaching those kids and inspiring them to be, take part in those other pieces of the infrastructure in the project, we're going to end up with bridges that don't work. Um, no services in the train stations and things like that. So there's really a compelling argument for all of you to get involved in your kids' education and the education systems around, around you. Because if you don't do this, um, it's not just about inspiring the next generation, it's about inspiring you all out there to get involved in your schools and in your, um, in your kids' education and in your neighborhood um, maker spaces. Because I, it's Berlin buzzword, so I had to put one buzzword in there, okay? So STEM, um, the science, tech, and engineering, and maths, um, is really um, a very key thing, in, at least in North America. That's um, one of the things next year in our British Columbia school system, um, it's mandated that STEM education is part. This is the first time. Um, the interesting thing about it is there's no training for the teachers. Uh, so they mandating it to be part of the curriculum, but there's no extra training. So there was some work to be done here. And I'm just going to pause for a minute, too, because the thing about it is a lot of people think, and there are some great programs out there, Girls at Code, Lady Pie, Pie, Pie Ladies, all kinds of wonderful things. A lot of people think about getting kids into STEM is teaching kids to code. And I'd actually ask you to step back and think about the first time you really got that this stuff was cool that you're, you're working on today. Like, for me, when I was, I think I was 10, my grandfather lived in Germany, and he would send Christmas presents back to my brother and I. And he was getting a little bit older, and he mixed up our ages, and he sent my six-year-old brother uh, an electronics kit to build one of those old-fashioned phones, you know, you lift off the receiver. And my dad, who was an engineer and German, swapped the gifts. 
It was the only thing that he did different. He gave me the telephone kit, and I put it together with his help, and I started to see everything that was inside of a telephone. It was the first time I was 10. You know, I'd never seen electronics. I'd never been allowed to take a phone apart or do any of those sorts of things. But it was an, what I call an epiphany, a magic moment, a connection with my dad and a connection with the technology underneath the thing. Now, today, if you take apart your iPhone, it, you know, uh, it breaks the warranty, right? If you, um, really, you take apart anything like that, it's, you know, that's it. That's the end of it. You crack the glass, it's gone. Believe me, I have daughters, and I've seen them dropped in toilets, in, in lakes, in oceans, and everything. So that's not a magical experience. So we have to figure out where we can find those epiphany moments. So rather than focusing on you know, getting 10-year-olds to learn how to do Scratch, which is a great thing, or to use other programming, what I've been focusing on is trying to figure out that, how to bring a magical moment to the kids that will connect them with technology in a way that will have continue through the rest of their lives. Because the traditional method of um, teaching, we've all been there, most of us didn't have um, the opportunity to go through uh, alternative schools. So normally you sit like you are in the theater today and you get, it gets pushed out onto you. Um, you're just the consumer. You don't get to control what actually is being taught. You don't drive the agenda. The agenda is, oh, you're going to pass these exams, so you need to know these things. Um, and it's a lot of abstract concepts. And it's very, what I would say, surface learning. Oops, one time, too many. So um, learning is um, a process. And for me, it, it is a very social process. If you remember the time that you spent in your classes and everything, it was about being with your peers, peer pressure, all of that good stuff. And the environment in which you learn makes a really big difference. So if you're sitting at a wooden desk with an inkwell and you know, things aren't getting aren't advancing with the technology that you have at home, things are going to be not jiving in terms of what they want to learn. And lots of people learn in different ways, and so when you're organizing programs for people, you have to accommodate that. And if people uh, aren't comfortable in a classroom, or if they're afraid of technology, you have to accommodate for that as well. So for me, teaching um, and this kind of falls into that community development stuff that I do during my day job, is about organizing people and the environments in which they are um, learning in. So there's a concept, as I mentioned, that came out of um, Stanford University that I'm very um, in love with in terms of teaching. Connected learning. So what we're trying to do is create interactive um, experiences that are collaborative. So the kids are working with each other, they're working with the teachers, they're working across generations. Um, they're doing very practical things. So they make stuff and they um, take their ideas and their ideas are what drive um, the curriculum or the agenda of the day or of the workshop. They are never seen as being pushed on. They are the co-creators in this space. So this is really kind of important. Um, and they're leveraging their peer networks. So they're working with kids their own age. They're leveraging in what we have um, in British Columbia is called the cool schools or the leadership programs in some high schools. So we bring in kids of different ages. So it's not the adult running the course. So, so what we uh, try and do and is get the kids to teach each other. So we work with some of the older kids, then we, once someone's gone through a workshop, we make them the teachers for the next workshop. So we've been doing a lot of work around this. Uh, these are 10-year-old girls that are teaching each other a software package called Tinkercad. And they're creating some of these wonderful printable things. Um, and one of the things we're really hot on is you can download a rubber duck or a Hello Kitty icon um, and print it from Thingiverse or one of the many other things. But what we're trying to do is add, have them modify the images. So if you look closely here, they've put their name on and they've put a different base on and they've done stuff. And they're not even really aware that we're teaching them 3D spatial design. 
They're just in Tinkercad, they're just using it, and it's not gamifying, because they're using real tools, but they're just doing things that kids do naturally. They're exploring the tools, and they're the ones that decide what they're going to put on it, how they're going to extend it, not, um, not us, by any means. So the other thing that we do is um, we take, because printing, this is one lesson that we learned, that um, printing things takes, even one of these little small ones, takes about an hour, an hour and a half. So instead, um, the, I'm not sure how bright this is, the kids created an Unreal Engine game and dropped their images into the Unreal Engine and started um, playing, and much to my surprise, the girls were creating first-person shooter games and shooting themselves. So, yeah, ponytails, sweetness and light, and guns. And we weren't in America, we were in Canada. So, so there's a lot of this stuff is, is going on. So all this connected learning is, um, is stuff that I've learned in the past two and a half years of doing some of these workshops. And the other thing that's going on at the same time is this whole maker movement. You've got Fab Lab here, something called Beta something or other here in Berlin. And these are wonderful things. And this whole maker movement has changed the way that um, we think about it. It's like basically taking what my dad did for me at 10 years old, accidentally on purpose, I think, because he was an engineer. He was going to make an engineer out of one of us two kids. My brother's a musician. So, but what the makers do is they make cool stuff. We make all kinds of stuff. We play with Arduinos and minnow boards and raspberry pies and all kinds of fun stuff. But it's mostly boys. If you ever go into a maker space, it's kind of intimidating. Um, though everybody is very well-intentioned, um, it's very intimidating for a 10-year-old girl to go into one of those spaces. Uh, and and, mo and in, at least I was just in Austin, Texas a couple weeks ago, and not only that, but there's an age thing. You have to be there with a parent, and if you're, not, if you're not over 18, you have to bring a parent, you have to sign a waiver, and there's like all this extra stuff, so it's pretty cool. Then then there's more cool stuff at, at Maker Fairs, um, but those are uh, mostly in big cities. We did start our own with, in our things, but they're one-offs, so it happens one time a year, and that's not enough if you're trying to get people to have epiphany moments. We, did, we had over a thousand kids go through our workshops. It was a one-day Sunday event, and, uh, which was amazing, because there's only 30,000 people, did I mention that, in the entire coast, and a thousand of, of their kids showed up. And they came not just from our um, communities on the coast, but some of the islands and from downtown Vancouver as well. It was pretty amazing. But it was really a one-time event. And then there's maker spaces, which um, are great. Um, but it's kind of, for me, a zoo versus circuses. So the zoo um, is where you keep the geeks and you put them in, in the zoo and people come to it. Um, and the circuses are the maker fairs. So we bring that and we set them up for them um, right now. So I think of them, uh, the problem for us with maker spaces, with only having 30,000 people, um, is that there, in Berlin you can do that. You have enough center of gravity, enough people to actually join and be part of um, and pay for the rental costs and all that. But they're fixed locations. And um, there's a lot of overhead for us to do that. It doesn't quite work when you have a community, a rural community that's spread um, across an entire coastline. And for us in British Columbia, we have not only the schools to think about, but the First Nations kids that are living in, in, on the reservations um, and on banned lands that we want to reach. We have islands that we have to get to. We have ferries that we have to take. Um, we're very um, distributed. Canada is a vast country and there's a lot of people in very rural situations that aren't going to have enough money um, or enough um, bandwidth to actually be able to have um, a zoo for geeks. So we were trying to figure out two things. Um, besides how do we deal with this, the, the high overhead for the cost for the makerspace, but also to give them a ticket into the zoo. All right, so you want to have that epiphany moment but you also want to give them something that's the excuse to go into a makerspace or to go the next step beyond um, just doing the one-time workshop at a maker fair. And so um, we decided that we would bring the circus to them. 
And so what we did was we took a 1965 Al Joe trailer and gutted it completely and put inside of it um, a lab, um, two 3D printers, uh, a human-sized turntable. I'll show you some pictures of all this in a minute. And we built this out together and we decided that we would try and create a very welcoming environment. There are little um, Persian rugs inside, there's a couch, there's a pink pony, there's always a pink pony. There's usually a knitter outside, like in Tale of Two Cities, taking the names. Um, just trying to make the atmosphere very laid back, not clinical, not like a lab, but something really friendly that anybody would walk in the door to. So the other piece of it was, not only were we trying to bring this space to them, but what we wanted to do was not intimidate the teachers, because some of the teachers hadn't had tech training before. Some of the a lot of the teachers are women um, who haven't had, um, don't have that, didn't have that epiphany moment that I had at 10. Um, and so any of this technology, you really have to work with the teachers and get them on board, find the champions in the school systems, and have them understand the technology well enough so that then they can host the trailer coming to them and host the workshops. And so a lot of the, t the time that is upfront time teaching teachers about the technology. So I've done things like host a wine and cheese night at my house with a trailer and everybody's sipping wine and they're scanning each other. They're doing the work and they're getting, um, they're figuring out how to run one of these workshops. Because the other thing is inside the trailer, it's a very simple setup. It's not, um, it's not perfect. Okay, so I'm not making perfect 3D scans of people. I'm doing something that's rather low budget. We're using Xbox Connects. Um, we're not trying to make the perfect scan because that's one, teachers can't afford that. They can't afford, they can't replicate that. So you have to think about what it is that you're bringing to them. Can they replicate it? Can they host it themselves? Can they build it out themselves? So what we did, was we built a 3D selfie booth. Everybody knows what a selfie is. Everybody's taken a selfie. So the recognition of, of what the idea is here. And we didn't say that it was any more than that. And there were five steps that we we're trying to teach to them, um, to the kids. One is scanning, creating a 3D image. So this was making something other than a rubber duck or a Hello Kitty model or a... Um, a Lego chip, something that they could actually see themselves in. You get to see yourself in 3D for the first time. The first time I ever saw myself in 3D, I was in New York and the Shapeways folks had, were hosting something um, and they did me in 3D and I could, couldn't believe how bad my posture was. I was standing like this in, in the model, I'm like, that's not me, but it is me. But you don't realize that you've never seen yourself in 3D until you see yourself in 3D. And then there's cleaning it up, modding it, slicing it, and printing it. And so that's what we like to do. This is me inside of the trailer. We're using Xbox Connects. You can see some there. This is the human-sized turntable that we built out. Um, it goes around rather slowly. It's portable, so we don't have to keep it. We can take it out of there. We can move it someplace else. And basically, it's a, a single Xbox Connect hooked up to a, a machine, a larger desktop machine that's running Windows 10. Yes, I am a Red Hat person and I'm running Windows 10, it's okay. Um, and Windows has some wonderful software now. If anybody opens a .stl file on a Windows 10 desktop, it just automatically pops into 3D Builder. It's pretty amazing. It's not open source yet though, so we're gonna work on that. Um, what is another piece of software that if you don't want to use the Windows, you can use the older version of Xbox Connects, um, and they'll work wonderful with some software called Sconnect. The 3D Builder, though, does full color scans, and that's pretty cool. So one of the things that we also teach them about is cleaning up software, and there's a, a software package called Mesh Labs that we use and we teach uh, kids, how to when you scan someone, if, if you miss the top of their heads, often there'll be a hole in your head, and that's where the light comes in. Um, and we teach them how to clean them up so that they get the next stage. So, and we're doing all this, and they don't really realize that we're teaching them like new skills or anything. They just want the scan. They want themselves printed in 3D, or they want to see themselves inside of the games. 
So um, this woman is uh, Emily. She's, she and her husband, who's 90, um, visited the workshop. And um, it brings me to another point about the age. We, we tend to focus on just bringing these experiences to kids and making kids, but when we bring these, these workshops to folks, the grandparents come, the grandparents are bringing the kids. It's just really starting to think about the spread of the ages of people that you can inspire and get um, addicted to some of this. So we, tr we teach the kids using Tinkercad, um, which is from Autodesk, a wonderful company, and it's all free stuff. So we're really trying to keep the, the barrier to entry for all of this so that my kids don't just learn PowerPoint, they're gonna learn Tinkercad, Mesh Labs, 3D Builder, all of this stuff is available and um, readily for free. So the other really cool thing is that um, if you're in Tinkercad, everybody's kids and most of us have all played Minecraft, you can export these scans directly into Minecraft now. So that's lots of fun. And uh, there. So the other thing, we have a great sponsor in Tinkerine. I don't think you've probably heard of them, but they're, they are a group of guys in Vancouver who came out of one of the, the south of Vancouver maker groups and started up a 3D printing thing, and they supplied us with all the printers for our maker labs, and they make, just like printers before, they can make all their money, not really off the printers, but off of selling you the resin and the PLA and the plastics. But um, that's how we get kids to go all the way through this cycle, and we teach them all of these things, they don't really understand that they're being, you know, coerced into learning new software because we've, we've gotten them to do it interactively and play with it all. Um, now we're starting to expand the curriculum a lot. So we got that first one um, worked out, and we do that throughout the school system. And now we're taking minnow boards, Intel's minnow boards, which is sort of like a Raspberry Pi on steroids, um, Android, um, I'm not Android, uh, Arduinos, and doing all kinds of little robotic workshops, too. But we really um, have had a huge success with the 3D scanning because it has given those kids that epiphany moment. And so we're always looking for those things that um, they see themselves in the tech, they learn what's the underpinnings of it. Um, some of the things, they do actually learn coding because um, they're modding Minecraft. They see some code in that. When they're in Tinkerine, if they want to write a special script to do bunny ears or something like that, they have to go down an alley or down a path and see the script and modify that. So without really forcing them, they're taking um, control of the agenda. And the whole thing around gaming, which was um, quite interesting to me, is I'm not a gamer. I, the last time I played games was Ms. Pac-Man, a long time ago. Um, and these kids... Um, downloaded Unreal Engine on one of the machines, which is now free, and they started building, playing with it, twiddling around with the things, and so we ended up having to go and find um, folks from Polycount, which is the forum for um, Unreal Engine, um, and Unity, and all kinds of other things, and they came in, they sponsored us, and they started giving us um, web uh, classes on how to do Unreal Engine, and and that's where we started playing with all of these wonderful first-person shooter games. And we're, we're not experts by any means, but I'm really not an expert at all because um, this, this stuff is one of, the, one of the things about it. Like, I would never have come up with shooting golden statues in, as a game, and, actually, and it's quite loud and it has paintballs and all that. But what they're learning is they're, they're doing some coding inside of Unreal Engine, they're building um, environments and worlds, they're learning all the spatial design stuff that, you know, if they're going to be draftsmen or architects or engineers, all of those skills are coming in this, um, in this sort of backdoor way without me having to say, okay, we're gonna sit down and learn drafting today. We're gonna learn um, what a spline is today, what a curve is, those things. It all comes in naturally, and this sort of stuff is what they're, um, yeah, it's the fun stuff. I love that this is in a movie theater, because it's the first time I've seen it on a huge screen like this, it's great. And uh, yeah, that's somebody's grandmother there. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, oh, that's Brian. But yeah, 
And this is stuff that you wouldn't think that um, 10-year-olds and 12-year-olds and 14-year-olds could um, just take off with and do. But because we're using these techniques that the teachers are teaching me, um, we are getting to do all kinds of new things. And so the next stage that we're doing um, is really sort of taking apart some of those Internet of Things um, tools and tasks. Uh, if you if you want to teach kids about security and privacy, you can't say you're teaching kids about security and privacy on the internet. You have to figure out some way to explain to them that these things, once you take them apart, are watching you constantly, um, and that they um, play wonderful music, but they're also trying to get you to buy stuff on Amazon Prime. Um, this is the Amazon Echo, which we actually got one of up and uh, to take apart and play with. And it's wonderful. It does things like uh, plays all the music that they want to hear, tells them jokes, has Siri-like capabilities called Alexa. You can ask it a question. It'll tell you the weather in Berlin. I did that just before I did, left here. Um, and it's, it's really a pretty magical experience. However, you can just play, use it or... Whoops, I lost my pictures. Okay, well, I lost the picture somehow and that thing. We actually took it apart, looked at what was in it under the hood, um, and took a suitcase, an old leather suitcase, put in a couple of speakers, put in a little, um, a couple of uh, Arduino boards in it, and we're running uh, a Bluetooth off of that so that they could walk by with their phones and touch with, um, with their Androids do NFC or Bluetooth and put, push whatever song they wanted to from their, their iPhone onto the, into the suitcase. Um, and we've just added in now the microphone and we're calling the API for um, the Amazon Alexa API to, to do the voice recognition. So they're actually, take, it may not be as compact and beautiful, but we have a nice little leather suitcase. And in that we're um, rebuilding from scratch completely open source the, um, the IoT device. And again, that's something that I would not have done, um, but the kids drove us and moved the agenda into that space. The other thing that, um, there's a lot of other projects out there um, that we're connecting with, the Enable the Future folks um, that are doing prosthetic hands. There's lots of um, cool stuff around that um, that we've been doing. So what our goal is, is we have um, the first two of those trailers that we've built out. And what we do is we take those, we fill them up with all the supplies that we need. We teach the teachers um, how to run the workshops. And then we engage, get them to engage the cool school or other leadership programs. And we'll have time for Q&A, yes. So we teach the teachers that, and we leave the trailer actually on site. I go away, because I work, uh, I have a day job. I, it's not me teaching the classes. So the goal is not really for me to be the one coming and doing a workshop, though the first year I did a lot of them. Um, the goal is to have that trailer be accessible and be a resource for teachers on, on campus at the schools, on uh, First Nations um, reservations, on band land with their, their school system. Um, and take it to maker fairs and do workshops there. But to be able to take that um, mobile maker space and leave it behind, fully stocked. And to do that, we, we do a lot of tech events like this to raise money and get sponsorship. Um, but we're really trying to inspire a movement. And right now, there's the two that we have up on the coast, um, that were one that's in action and one that's being built out. And there are three of them in Vancouver. And so I had this vision when I started this whole thing, you know what a food truck is, of having food truck rallies, but having maker truck rallies, so that we'd all bring all of our different technologies around and, and have a circle the wagon moment with all different tech. So what my goal is, is really not to make you have to come or to your kids have to come to a maker space or just have a one day make one off maker fair moment but to be actually be able to bring these circuses to the schools, to underserved communities um, across Canada, and in where we go, we go all the way down to Portland, Oregon, and Washington, um, 
and Seattle, Washington, so we go through the whole Pacific Northwest. But my goal is really to start to inspire an entire movement of mobile makerspaces to take and be as resources for teachers and the next generation to get that epiphany moment going. And of course, we do a lot of automating of all the workflows, and if you want to talk to me later about Kubernetes or Docker or any of that fun stuff, I'm quite happy to do that. But really what it is all about, it's all about the kids. We have to thank our sponsors because we have lots of them. Um, there should be one more logo up there. Microsoft donated a whole whack of Xbox Connects to us recently, so we're very grateful for that. Um, and with that, I'd say thank you very much for listening to me and our story, and hopefully someday you'll be inspired to create a mobile makerspace um, or to work within the school systems and bring some of these new epiphanies to kids um, elsewhere. This is how you can reach me, this is how you can tweet us, um, and if you're interested in learning more, I'd be happy um, to talk to you all, and I'll take some questions if people have them. Get a microphone. Thank you. Do I have... We have 10 minutes for questions, so um, I'm not quite sure. Okay, now I have sound. Um, so uh, please raise your hands if you um, have any questions. Okay, it's early morning. <laughs> it's 1.30 a.m. for me, so I really want to thank you all very much. And I can't see anybody's hands up because it's... We have one question. One question way up here. All right, great. So it, I probably all told, spent about, um, I would say, if I'm really honest, about seven or eight grand um, of my own money that got put into it. Probably, if I'm totally honest, a little bit more. Um, I'm very good at coercing people into doing things. So the coast makers um, are, there's electricians, cabinet makers. Uh, if you work with your local makers group, um, if you went to Fab Lab or something, you could find the people to help you build it out. There's, um, and, we, and I'm also pretty good at, at coercing sponsors into donating things like printers. If I had to pay for everything that I did, it would probably be around 20 grand. But um, it wasn't. I mean, it really is a collaborative effort, and I think that's the thing. And once you get into the school systems, then it makes it even easier. Um, there's another question here, and the microphone is actually right behind you. Oh, that's quite easy. I was wondering, uh, th this seems like a, a really bottom-up approach. So yes. you try to reach the kids uh, using your uh, uh, caravan, like we say here in, uh, in uh, Europe. Um, I was wondering, did you try to try a more top-down reach into the, the, the education system and try to establish something there? It's, it's, it's a very good question. Um, so, we, um, on the coast where we are, um, I started, go, I, I did this, I did an earlier iteration of this, which was called Discover Totems, because um, there are so many First Nations folks, I was trying to teach tech that way, and so I would go and I would be the one person that would go and deliver a course and get approved by the teachers and the curriculum to teach this one course, and it just didn't scale. So what we're, I'm, I don't scale. Um, I'm not multi-tenant and I can't, you can't put me in a container. So, um, so we did, and, and, but I wasn't leaving behind enough skills. So uh, the, the, next, the next iteration of that, I decided to get out, step outside of it and not make it about me and work with a whole bunch of collaborators. And in those collaborators are the principals from some of the, cool, the, the school systems on the Sunshine Coast. And the first year was really about developing a curriculum that people would have um, epiphany moments and trying to figure out what that is and get sponsors and build the whole thing out. And almost immediately, as soon as we had something real, like it wasn't just talk, um, the school systems just invited us in. And so now we are working in collaboration with the local school systems for BC and hopefully spreading it all across um, British Columbia and Canada. Um, but this, this model scales 
because it's not about individual people doing it. You can build out a trailer, you can train teachers, you can train you know, the older students to teach the courses. And that's really the difference, I think, than just coming in and doing, yeah, look at me, I have all my cool tech um, for one day. That's not replacing the PowerPoint issue. So, thank you. Any other question? Yeah, please come to the microphone. There's a very bright spotlight, so I'm going to keep... So you're working on this full-time? No, I am not. Um, I'm working for Red Hat full-time. Um, this is something, because I have collaborators, there's one other um, person on the coast who is a full-time uh, person working on it uh, at the moment. Uh, there are about six kids that are trained now that can do the stuff on the inside of the trailer and we're working over the summer with the teachers. So there, there is no full-time employee. This is all the, that group of coast makers that you saw, that kind of ragtag band of folks. Those are the people that are keeping the trail, building the trailers and keeping them up. It's a big collaboration. So basically you get them and you get the kids to do it themselves. That's what you do, you recruit the kids. You recruit the kids and it's really easy to do. You know, once you get it in there, if you figure out the right sort of thing to do, you know, you're not like, Teach saying you will learn Unreal Engine. You know, you will do, well, I'm going to have to learn now next um, the Occultus Rift, the VR stuff, because that's the next thing they decided they wanted to learn. So the next trailer is a VR trailer. And all of that stuff is coming in July. So um, the person who only knows Pac-Man is going to do VR this summer. And so I, I get a lot out of it too. So I learn all this new tech, but it's, it's by no means a full-time job. How does the gender balance go as the kids go older? As, uh, you have to make a concerted effort to um, get the girls involved. Um, the gender balance in the early, younger ages, just doing the 3D stuff, it's 50-50. There's no imbalance. It's um, trying to get them in the leadership roles is, you ha takes, takes, an e takes effort and takes attention. So. Um, my goal, the first year, uh, the first Maker Fairs that we did, I ran the workshops. This past one, the entire um, trailer was set up and run by three 14-year-old boys. And my goal next year is that the whole thing is run by girls. Okay. So it's, it's, it definitely takes a concerted effort. Okay, thanks. We have time for a very short question. So yeah, please come to the microphone. Um, hi, I want to do you know Kodo Dojo from Ireland, the movement? Yeah, I've seen. Yeah, maybe it could combine somehow, I don't know. Yeah, so we do, so we have on the coast, um, like I said, we're sort of the fastest growing maker community in all of Canada that's happening right now. And we have folks that do scratch and all sorts of other teaching coding stuff. So what I've focused on is, is what I knew, you know, the 3D design and the spatial stuff. Um, but we have other curriculums that are coming in to teach teach that and it is we learn from all the other the dojo from pi ladies from girls that code all kinds of great organizations out there the enable the future is is another one that you know we had 3d printers red hat had a relationship with them um i met them all at red hat summit it, it's an amazing network of people out there doing this kind of stuff um the key is to figure out a model that's repeatable and scalable that you can keep bringing back because there's a lot of burnout in this kind of stuff. So when you create uh, this, there's a sort of an arc for maker spaces. Um, they'll get total enthusiasm, donations, find a space, build a space, and for the first two or three years, they'll have great, uh, you know, great um, number of people participating, using the space, using. And as the volunteer board gets tired of being the volunteer board, they kind of arc and wane. Um, so we've seen a bit of that. So it's, we're, we're trying really hard to um, scale the model, get incorporated into the school systems, and work, work in tandem. 
So if this, I think that's the end yeah. of my time. I really want to thank you for having me come to Berlin. I get a chance to see some of the maker spaces here and to meet all of you. And um, I'll be around afterwards um, drinking more coffee because it is 1.30 a.m. And um, I'll be outside and you can ask any more questions. So thank you very much. <laughs>